Good afternoon. Uh, we are uh, have come here sponsored by the Moose Lake Area Historical Society. Uh, those of us here, Harold Hopwea, Denise Reed, and myself, Dan Reed, uh, we, among a number of uh, uh, people, have been active members of the Kalevala Theater Society. Uh, we've done a number of plays over the years, uh, two different fire plays, and, uh, and a number of plays centering on life uh, in, in, uh, at other times in our local area. Uh, one was rather current this last year called The Naked Woods. It was about two guys working in the woods. And so we do that sort of thing. But uh, we have come today, we were asked to come to speak on the 100th anniversary of the Cloquet Moose Lake fire or what's called the fires of 1918. And those fires uh, at that, during that uh, October the 12th, Columbus Day in 1918, uh, it, it became the largest natural disaster in Minnesota. Think about that, the, the, the largest natural disaster in Minnesota. It was uh, second in the United States of a fire for loss of life. Uh, the only one that was larger in loss of life was the Peshtigo fire along Lake Michigan in western Wisconsin in the 1870s. The reason you don't hear about it very much is because that was the day also with high winds and uh, a low dew point when Chicago burned. And so some statistics about this uh, 1918 fire is that uh, there was 453 people killed outright. Uh, seriously burned were 85. A lot of them died within a few days. Uh, the old ones used to say that that 453 was a low figure. That included both the fire in, that swept through and burned Moose Lake. It also included this Cloquet Brookston fire that went through Saginaw and burned parts of Duluth, but didn't burn uh, the large portion of Duluth. The wind died, otherwise Duluth would have burned also. Uh, they, but the old one said that there was probably 50 to 100 people more that burned because they didn't find a lot of people. Now some people being itinerants, that means they worked all over the United States and if there was work here and from uh, the sawmills, logging camps, some of the big projects working, mining and that, uh, they would show up, work for a while and then they would travel on. And so they, uh, the old ones always felt that the fire uh, statistics were low. Um, uh, a major flu ep epidemic was in the process and came right afterwards. There was 106 people died from the flu, weakened by uh, smoke, inhalation, and heavy heat and that. They were uh, prime suspects for the flu. Those that were injured, maimed, or crippled for life. There was 2,100 had got medical attention because of the fire. Uh, the property damage from the fire commission was estimated at $45 million. These were the days when there was a two cent stamp on a letter. If you put that in today's terms, you're talking about a billion dollar loss. There was uh, about 1,500 square miles burned. 26 towns and villages in eight, in eight counties burned overnight. Um, t uh, marketable timber and also timber that was tie piles, boards, that sort of thing, in the millions and millions uh, burned that day. Uh, of wildlife and livestock, uh, there 
was uh, burned to death were over 4,000 uh, cows, horses, that sort of thing. 54,000 chickens, uh, over 9,000 animals that survived the fire. Uh, there was no feed, no hay, no barn. Uh, a lot of that had to be taken overnight. There's pictures of women milking the cows with a cow hooked up to a fence post. Uh, the um, uh, overall, there was over 4,000 houses burned, over 6,000 barns, 41 school buildings, and many churches. In, in the city you're sitting in now, uh, on that day, 100 years ago, the whole town burned except for the Garfield School was left. And then the mills mostly were left. The mills were at Dunlop Island. And the reason the mills were left is because they had uh, major steam plants and that and they got the pumps running and they took the water out of the river and they kept hosing down everything. That's the only reason they survived. Um, on the end, but just keep it as, in mind as we're going through this, this is the largest natural disaster in Minnesota, and it was a hundred years ago. Hello. The world of 1918 in Minnesota and our area was impacted by three major events. The fires of 1918, the First World War, and the flu epidemic. An event and a Native American prediction coincidentally came within days of the October 12th fires that leveled our area. On this 100th anniversary of those fires, we should mark the Native American view of all this tragedy. To open settlement of our region, a treaty was negotiated and signed between the Chippewa peoples of this area and the federal government. Chief Joseph Osagi of the Chippewa Nation was recognized by then President Franklin Pierce and as head man of the Fond du Lac tribe was asked to sign the Treaty of 1854. Chief Osagi was living on Wisconsin Point which is across the bay from Duluth Park Point also known as Minnesota Point. In that treaty the land of Wisconsin Point was conveyed to the government. Years go by and the Chippewa continue to use Wisconsin Point as a burial ground site, and Chief Osagi was buried there in 1870s. Along comes World War I, and U.S. Steel Corporation wishes to build loading docks on Wisconsin Point for their steel products. The Chippewa refused to give them permission to relocate the native cemetery there. A great-grandson of Chief Osagi goes to the law offices of attorney John Cadigan and asks for help. He tells the attorney, my father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, Chief Joseph Osagi and many others lie buried on Wisconsin points. Their bones must not be disturbed. I tell you that the day the white man enters the point to dig up the remains of our ancestors will see this nation visit the most terrible fire in history swept by the most devastating plague and plunged into the bloodiest war the world has ever known. On October 8, 1918, U.S. Steel started to remove remains from the point. The attorney for the native descendants wrote, an undertaker was given $2,500 as an advance payment under a contract and took a crew to the point and started to move the graveyard. 200 remains were dug up, put on a garbage skull, and relocated to St. Francis Cemetery, and then reburied on the edge of a hill overlooking the Nemanji River. Attorney Cadigan continued, that day, about noon, the heavens became black for a time with a peculiar cloud by evening, the newspapers were filled with headlines of the Cloquet Moose Lake area fires, the largest natural disaster in Minnesota. The same paper conveyed news of the sweeping wave of influenza throughout the world 
and the bloody Musagone campaign leading up to the end of World War I with heavy American casualties. The desecration of the Wisconsin Point burial grounds was a futile move. U.S. still found the waterfront area too sandy for loading dock construction and built them in another area of the lake shore. Over the years, the native burial ground in the St. Francis Cemetery was a victim of erosion to the Nemaji River waters, and many of the native graves were washed away. The natives say their ancestors were returning to Wisconsin Point. Hi, <clears throat> I am Harold, but today I am William Mackey. I had a partnership with my brother-in-law, Charles Yokimaki. I had married Olga Yokimaki about 1910 and lived up in the Yokimaki country of Altomba on a farm next to the farms owned by Yokimaki brothers, William, Arthur, and Charles. Charles and I worked hard and had three sawmills by the time of the 1918 fire. One mill was in the Altoma rail yard directly south of the Main Street and a half million board feet of lumber drying in piles. The others were north of town on the Dead Moose River. Our business interests were known as Yucky Mackey and Mackey. Matt Reed, who was married to our niece, Edna, had built a hotel in Otumba between the Ringo Brothers store and the depot. We bought this building and started a store and used it as a base of operations. Weeks before October, October 12th, Charlie and I and the men working for us fought the fires in the, on the west of of uh, the side of Altomba to keep the blaze out of the rail yard. Most of the Sioux Line track corridor from Kettle River through Altomba and on to Lawler was burning. The very topsoil was burning. Scores of men were fighting fire that Saturday before heavy winds came up. I believe small fires all the way to Tamarack rolled together in a wall of flame and swept into town. Within minutes, the rail yard and all the businesses were engulfed. My wife, Olga, Charlie, and I drove my Dodge car and headed out of town. The road was on the north side of the rail tracks and then went south to the Polish settlement. The road towards Kalevala had already been blocked by flames. As we left Main Street, the last thing I saw were burning curtains waving goodbye to us from the burning businesses and houses. The Whiting family was behind us, with their family loaded on a wagon pulled by horses. I knew they would never make it. They were found burned along the road to the Polish settlement later. Charlie drove the car as fast as he could to the south. The winds and the fl flames were, were like a tornado fire blowing burning trees over the road. We could drive no farther finally and got out and ran for our lives. We could have died in the smoke and fire, but we didn't. We could not help but think of the inferno in the Otomba rail yard and how those flames and heat were following us, trying to catch us. Our little group managed somehow to make our way to Jurek's field, where many refugees from the Polish settlement and from Otomba had gathered. As I remember, it was a large crowd the flames spared us there, but two of the neighborhood boys had decided to hide at the Jurek root cellar. 
not too far from us, and they died there. We went back to Otumba the next day. Mrs. Whiting was burned severely and was crying for her family. Area men had brought her to Mahowski's farm. She died there later. We found her family and other Otomba people dead along the road. Otomba was left. The highest thing left standing in town was Arvid Niamh's sauna stove. The rail yard was still in flames. And twisted rail cars and remnants of the large sawmills scattered throughout the area. Reports told of bodies, human and wild animals, floating in the middle ponds. Twenty-three people burned right in town or trying to get away. Within, within a couple of days, the bodies were lined up in a row at the rail siding waiting for coffins and transport. Charlie and I lost everything, and it broke us. Olga and I were lucky, though. We had our lives and our children. Charlie lost a son. Art lost a son. William lost his wife and six children. Olga and I, and brother-in-law Charlie, were the last ones to get out of Otomba alive. There was no time for sorrow. Winter was coming. Charlie headed the Red Cross relief work in Otomba, distributing food and building materials for Red Cross shacks. My wife Olga was temporary postmaster for Altumba because the current postmaster Krampari had a nervous breakdown after his elderly parents. Both burned to death in Altumba. I found work building houses to get through the first winter. And then we rebuilt started over. Again, my name is Dan, but today I'm playing the part of one of the Yangala boys. I am Jalmer Yangala, also known by Jacobson. I and my brother William were well-known farmers and sawmill operators in the Kettle River area at the time of the fire. My father was Matt Yangela, born in Torneo, Finnish Sweden, and was in West Duluth in about 1890 to marry my mother, Hilda Leon. They had a farm in what was then Split Rock Township, but now is Section 6 of Silver. Four children were born there. Me, William, Alma, and Hilda. Times were difficult for my parents. I and my siblings were boarded out to local families. And one of us went to a family in Midway Township near Duluth. My mother finally went to Fergus Falls State Hospital and died there in 1900 of tuberculosis. My father remarried in 1903 to Greta Anna Lettoma, and William and I worked for him on his farm. The Sioux line came through our split rock property in 1909, and my father saw an opportunity to work for railroads and their, con and their construction contractors. 
There was an auction sale in 1909, and we sold everything on the farm. By 1910, my father, William, and I were section hands for a railroad, and we were living in Midway Township by Duluth. By 1915, William and I were back in Kettle River, and we had bought a steam tractor, a sawmill, and a threshing machine. And we threshed grain for farmers in the area in the fall, and ran a sawmill the rest of the year. We had a small logging jobbers that supplied saw timber for us. We did some custom saw work. At times we ran our own logging camps to supply saw bolts and market wood. We had a mill site in the southwest corner of Kettle River about well, two, three years before the fire. And we sawed saw bolts and, and the market wood there and box bolts and lath. Finally, we ended up uh, sawing near Atumba, and in that neighborhood we had sawmill workers, including the neighborhood friend Hugo Lusla from west of Kettle River, Emil Corby, Richard Mackey, John and Will Oyoki Mackey, Nestor and Walter Peters, Nick Coivisto, and Ina Rayala, the cook. William and I had a sawmill, at the time of the fire located just west of William Yoki Mackey's farm. And he also had a sawmill. Now Ray Johnson's farm in Atumba Township and had a million board feet of lumber piled on both sides of the road at the time of the fire drive. The sawmill was located on the south side of the road. We thought we could save our sawmill and the lumber piles, but a wall of flames came from the northwest. It was hopeless. As we fled the sawmill area to the northeast, flaming boards were flying through the air from our burning lumber piles, some going as, fa as far as half a mile. We made it as far as Bill Mackey's farm, located about a quarter mile to the northeast of the mill, and we could go no farther. What to do? The crew of five, Lusua, Corpi, Rayala, William, and I, we climbed into the well, hanging from the well rope. The rope burned, and we died there, drowned, maybe from lack of, lack of oxygen. For two days, the search parties looked for us. They looked in the area wells, but they could see nothing. They searched the woods. Nick Coimisto, who had been working for us at the time, searched with Nestor Peters. Finally, they tied two burned boards together with some burned fence wire, and they stirred Bill Mackey's well. And a head and an arm bobbed up. They had found us. A group of men gathered. People argued who to send down the well to attach a rope and pull us out. At the same time, our white horse walked up to the edge of the well and just stood at attention and did not move. Matt Reed came from Art Yokimaki's home and asked if he could help. The group told him of their dilemma. Matt said, ha, he would climb down there and secure our bodies with a rope. He commented, you know, he hadn't been afraid of us when we were alive. Why would he be afraid of us now? 
the group pulled our bodies out and loaded them on a wagon for transport to Moose Lake. We were interred with 200 others in a mass grave and were there now. During all this activity, our horse stood by the well. Once our bodies were hauled away, the horse, he turned around and wandered off. Meanwhile, our folks, Matt and stepmother Greta Anna and Uncle Tom, all lost their lives in Kettle River. Our stepmother was found after the fire clutching her spinning wheel on the school corner. Our father was found to the east in Oddberg's field. The folks and my uncle joined us in the mass grave in Moose Lake. After the fire, Matt Wilson, a 12-year-old boy, found a coffee can full of bonds and money and legal papers and returned it to the family that was left alive. The can which had contents value, valuing $2,000 was found lying on Oddberg's field. He was rewarded for his honesty. Fond du Lac area, as reported by Dan Anderson, educator and historian, October 10, 1989. The most important historical event in the Cloquet area was the fire of October 12, 1918, also known as the fires of 1918. Much has been written about these fires, but little about their effect on the Fond du Lac Reservation. In researching the history of the Fond du Lac Reservation, I found that Joseph Pitt lost his house, barn, wagon, sleighs, furniture, all clothing, all feed, two pigs, a coop, and 50 chickens. In 1921, he testified about the fire in a suit filed against the United States Rail Administration. I was pulling rutabagas and carrots and beats that day, all day. I got through a little after four. We had passed down by the church, but the Indian village, the sparks all fell over, big as balls, some of them. You can see the fire flying all over us. The fire was right close to us, just about a half a mile away from us, and the wind so strong that it caught up with us pretty near before we got down to the church. You could hear it crackling and sparks coming over us. No Indian people died in the fire, but its effect was horrifying, as Elizabeth Gurnow recalled in 1976. I was only four or five years old, but I remember it. My grandfather was a timber cruiser, and he was out in Brookston. He rode a horse out in the woods, and he knew that the fire was out of control. And he raced to my mother's house and said, go to the river. So my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother, we all took blankets and some food and left everything else just as it was. Went to the river hollering as we went to the other homes on the way to get down to the river. And my brothers stood waist deep in water and dumped blankets and traded and we had blankets on top of us. They dried out as fast as they put them on. Right on the top of this hill where our church now stands was a cemetery. And there was a church there too. One man and a couple of his brothers were throwing water on folks and they could hear all of these people hollering on top of the hill in Indian, come and get us. Come and help us. We're burning. They said that by
by this time they were, uh, were at the top of the hill. They went up to see who it was. No one was left up there. The church was burnt. My grandmother always said that the dead were hollering. They were burning too. There wasn't anything left. This is a story about Charles and Hilda Hakkarainen and their children, Lily, Hilda, and Tina, as told by one of the children. The air smelled of smoke and the sun was a red ball in the sky for weeks. In the in late afternoon of October 12, 1918, on orders from the constable next door, father and our neighbor, Essa Ikula, went with him to fight fire. When they arrived at another neighbor's place, a teenager hitched his newly broken colt to a stone boat. <clears throat> On this, they had a barrel, which they filled with water from Hay Creek, and off they went on their errand. Reaching the top of the big hill, they saw the miles and miles of countryside already in flames. Their barrel of water being of little use, they ran the cold back home. Father and Essa ran back to our place where Father quickly harnessed his horse to a plow, <clears throat> to plow a fire break around the buildings. He urged Essa to go home to protect his own place, but Essa was sure his farm was safe on the other side of the newly built Canadian Northern Railroad. The grade was gravel and no vegetation, and with no vegetation and would serve as a good fire break, or so Essa figured. By the time Father had plowed two furrows, the fire was upon us. With the gale wind, the fire was in the air as much as on the ground, and soon the flaming debris ignited the grass and timber across the tracks. Essa exclaimed, trouble, and took off for home. His clothes snagged on the barbed wire fence and his pants caught on fire, but nothing stopped him. In the meantime, mother milked the cows and turned them out. In the house, my nine-year-old sister, Lily, was urging my sister, Hilda, a seven-year-old, to carry in the wood as it was her turn. The fire will burn the house, so it is no use to fill the wood box, said Hilda. Tina was five at the time, and it wasn't my turn, so I didn't volunteer. The wood box unfilled we, had, we were recruited to fight fire, so with gallon syrup pails, we carried water on any spark and flames within reach. Wild animals, rabbits, skunks, and squirrels ran across the yard with no fear of the dog or us. Their only enemy was the raging fire. Mother drew water with rope and bucket from our winch-type well and carried it to father, who then carried it on up the ladder to the roof of the house. The wooden shakes were tinder dry from weeks of drought. And the burning debris flying in the air was a constant threat. The neighbor's cows wanted a drink, crowded around mother's water pails, making it doubly hard for her. When the fire neared the barn, Father took time out and carry, from carrying water up the ladder to get a cold from the barn, turned loose. Sensing the danger outside, the cold refused to go, and Father had to, to throw a gunny sack over its eyes and nose in order to lead him out. By then it was too late to rescue a young calf. By late evening, the three girls had exhausted themselves and we were 
bedded down in a plowed field nearby. Wet quilts covered us. But they dried out quickly in the intense heat. So every now and then, mother threw water on them. Often, six eyes peered from under the covers. Once, to watch the wall of the log barn, the logs now bright red coals fall, tilt and fall to the ground. The pitiful cry of the calf was heard, but not for long. The six eyes also saw father pull the burning wagon away from the hay barn. Later we were told how scared he was that the hay barn would burn. For in the road cellar underneath were 100 pounds of dynamite and caps for future land clearing. Meanwhile, Esso went home, the fire licking at his heels. The family there fought to save the buildings by carrying water from the well as my folks were doing. They had the misfortune of their well drying up. But this did not stop their efforts for long. They opened the seepage pit under the barn and carried the liquid from that to save the, or the house and the barn. With pioneer stamina and Finnish sisu, father and mother labored one night, um, all night until five in the morning. Exhausted and suffering from a migraine headache, father laid down. Mother still small but wiry, decided to get to see how the neighbor, the nearest neighbors had fared. There she came upon two wash tubs by the well, one with the burning, burned bodies of two girls, the other had the young boy, also burned to death. <coughs> Further on, the smoldering body of the mother lay on the ground. The husband was standing over her, lamenting. The paper money is all gone. Only the coins are left. It is possible that he had gone crazy and didn't know what he was doing anymore, or that he just didn't care. Having been stopped because of a burned out trestle, an engineer and brakeman from a train were there. The engineer doubled his fist but refrained from using it on the husband. Doing the best she could, the mother had put the children in tubs of water and then took the bureau drawer, attempting to save the valuables. The husband, the constable, after leaving my father and Essa had ordered his family to stay home while he spent the night in the safety of a neighbor's kitchen. Home again, mother <clears throat> related to a father the horrible tragedy at the constables. Also having good news, she told him, our cows and horses are safe by the hay shed in the West Meadow. Miraculously, they, had saved, they were saved when all the meadow around was burned. Father could only say, you must be dreaming. The, the smell of smoke and the human, <clears throat> the smell of burnt human flesh and animal flesh, scorched potatoes and rutabagas from various cellars smoldered. Smoldering manure piles and peat bogs was nauseating. The red ball in the sky was not totally obscured from view by the dense smoke. With ashes light still caked on our faces from the long night, we counted our blessings. Our family and home were safe. We had our cattle, two sheds full of hay, and the dynamite was still intact. Later, my parents surveyed the, lot, the fire losses and realized the many years of labor that went up in 
smoke that night. The barn, 7,500 feet of lumber, three hay sheds, all the fences, farm implements and business and harnesses, much more were and much more were lost. The all important sauna was reduced to a pile of rock. With metal pails warped beyond recognition. Ten cords of pine and birch firewood split ready for the stove were gone. Not a stick was left to put in the unfilled firebox. Again, the reason why this 100th anniversary is so important, it is a time of great loss, the largest natural disaster in Minnesota, and yet the people that were left they decided to rebuild, to have families, build businesses, and start a new life here. And it is not only a story of great destruction and sorrow, but it's also a wonderful story of rebirth. Thank you very much for hosting us. Go home and ask your people if they know any fire stories.